We can turn our Bibles again to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I will read verse 16 to 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Of course, today we are celebrating Thanksgiving. And it's often being said that we shouldn't be so focused on the day of Thanksgiving per se, but on the life of thanks living. And what we're meaning by that is that we shouldn't have merely a day on our calendar. It's good to have such a day, but we shouldn't merely have a day on our calendar, one out of 365, where we decide to be thankful. But instead, the whole Christian life is to be one of thankfulness. In fact, this is woven into the very fabric of our confessions I just think of our Heidelberg Catechism and the whole third section on the Christian life is titled, Of Thankfulness. And so this is is what characterizes being a Christian. In fact, being a Reformed Christian should be synonymous with being a thankful Christian. But not only is this woven into the fabric of our confessions, it's woven into the pages of scripture. Let me give you one example, Ephesians 5.20. Apostle Paul says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there are multiple passages like that, giving thanks always for all things. We could add more, but we see the same thing in our text here in 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 16 to 18. And so we want to look at this passage under the title, Thanks Living. First, we'll see the threats to thanks living, uh, the things that might uh, steal our thankfulness. Second, the call for thanks living. And third, the reason for thanks living. So thanks living, first of all, the threats We need to start with this first point if we're going to benefit from this text. Uh, And here's the reason why. Maybe you've had the experience where someone comes up to you and and you're in the, uh, the midst of a difficult season and they tell you, just look at the bright side of things. Come on, have an optimistic spirit. But if someone keeps saying that to you for a long period of time, eventually they sound out of touch with your reality and insincere. Uh, they just don't get what I'm going through. You look at your circumstances and, and there's no bright side to what you're going through. You examine it at every angle, as it were. And it just seems dark and, and dismal and depressing. And so maybe when you read, rejoice always, you think, Well, Apostle Paul, that sounds great, but that is out of touch with my life. You don't understand what I'm going through. It sounds more like a Hallmark card. Rejoice always. But there are at least two reasons why we cannot dismiss the Apostle Paul, besides the fact that this is the inspired, authoritative, and always relevant word of God. Two other reasons. And the first one is we have to consider who's talking. We have to consider who is, who is writing this passage. Paul, the Apostle Paul, he knew suffering like few other people. Uh, we read Acts 17, and there we heard about the Apostle Paul escaping these mobs, these crowds by the skin of his teeth, and that was in the city of Thessalonica. So the Thessalonians, to whom Paul is writing, they saw that Paul's suffering, they witnessed it, with their own eyes. They're the ones trying to help him escape the city as he's running for his life. And if we were just to back up a chapter to Acts 16, you would find the Apostle Paul in a dungeon in Philippi. And there he is, singing praises to God with Silas in the dark. It matters who's talking. 
This is the Apostle Paul. He knows suffering. He hasn't had a pampered life. And yet he says, rejoice always. When Johnny Erickson Tata speaks, we should listen. When she says something like, It is a glorious thing to know that your Father God makes no mistakes in directing or permitting that which crosses the path of your life. Our ears should perk up because it matters who's talking. When we look at at Johnny Erickson Erickson Tata's life, it, it looks like God made mistakes maybe on the surface. That fateful day when she was 17 and she took the plunge, she dove into the shallow water and and she broke her neck and became paralyzed. And now decades later, she's still in her wheelchair. She's writing this, know that God makes no mistakes. That comes to us in a different way when we recognize who's speaking. And so we need to understand that Paul, when he's writing this, he's the afflicted apostle. He's not one who's had an easy life. And yet he is saying, rejoice always. That's the first reason we can't dismiss our text. But the second one, and the one I want to focus on in this first point, is consider who Paul is talking to. So don't only consider who's talking, but consider who Paul is talking to. He's speaking to the Thessalonian believers. And here I want to ask, what was going on in the life of this church that might threaten their thankfulness? We want to try to understand who who are these people that Paul is speaking to. And so, for that reason, it's probably helpful for you to have your Bible open. I want to quickly go through 1 Thessalonians and draw out Uh, who these people are, what are they experiencing, what's threatening their thankfulness. And so let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1, or sorry, verse verse 6. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. This is page 1048. Verse 6. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, And so right at the start of the letter, Paul is saying, I'm writing to you knowing that you have endured much affliction. This coming from the Apostle Paul who knows affliction. And he's saying, I see that you've been through a lot just to receive the word of God. And so this first threat that we see is persecution. Persecution is the first threat to their thankfulness. Uh, If you go to chapter 2, Paul expands on it. Chapter 2, verse 14 Partway through that verse, Paul says, For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And so they have suffered the same type of violence that Jesus suffered, that the prophets like Jeremiah have suffered, and that Paul himself has suffered. This church has been violently persecuted. And then verse 17. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, and so through their persecution, their dear pastor Paul has been taken away, and really the word is torn apart, torn away from them. And so they're like a a scattered flock without a shepherd. And then verse 18. Satan is hindering Paul from returning to them. There's this spiritual warfare. And then chapter 3, 1 to 5, Paul is worried that Satan might shake them through their afflictions. And so in verse 5 of chapter 3, when Paul can no longer handle it, he sends Timothy to see how they're doing. This is a church going through much affliction. They're dealing with persecution. And that is a real threat to their thankfulness. But second, they are being threatened by temptations. Notice chapter 4. If you turn to chapter 4, verse 3, there are sexual temptations. Chapter 4, verse 3, This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, 
that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles, like the people who are living around you day after day, like the people who you go to work with. There's sexual temptations all around them, but don't be like that. Fight these temptations. Then there's lifestyle temptations. Verse 11. Aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Going on in the city right now, there's a revolutionary spirit. There is this temptation to, to quit their job and to go and join the mob and, and, and to cause a, a stir and a fuss. And Paul says, avoid that. Avoid that temptation. Then there are grieving temptations. Verse 13. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Church, I know that you have lost loved ones, but don't fall into the temptation of grieving like there is no hope, despairing like there is no hope. And then there are cultural temptations, chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. There Paul describes the culture with this one word, darkness. That's the description of the world they're living in, darkness, confusion, no truth, no light, and they're tempted to go along with it. And so in verse 8 of chapter 5, Paul says they need to put on their armor. They're in a warfare. They're fighting. Resist these temptations. Fight against temptations. These temptations, they're, they're, they're stealing your, your time, your energy, and it's a- a- attempting to take away your thankfulness as well, threatening your thankfulness. And then the third threat, not only persecution, not only temptations, but also division. And that is the context of our passage here, uh, beginning in verse 12. Paul says, We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Paul saying, Respect your leaders. We urge you. And he wouldn't need to urge them if this was natural for them. If this was something they were easily doing, he wouldn't need to urge them. But, but there's this temptation for division to go against their leaders. Verse 13, be at peace among yourselves. Peace seems fragile in the Thessalonian church. And the reason why comes in verse 14. The church has its fair share of unruly members, faint-hearted members, Weak members, people aren't seeing eye to eye. There's this threat to, to, to disunity. And so they need to admonish, encourage, and help one another. Don't be torn apart, but, but avoid that division. In verse 15, those, there are those who are looking to retaliate and stab their brother in the back. There's division in this church. It's ugly. It's draining. It's threatening their thankfulness. So that's what the Thessalonians are dealing with. It's not that Paul is writing to people who are going through an easy experience. Paul is writing to those who are suffering persecution, fighting temptations, and burdened by divisions. And yet he still calls them to thankful living. And so here's the point for us. If thanks living depended on one's circumstances, then there would be no hope for the Thessalonians. If our thanks living depended on our circumstances, there would be no hope for this church that Paul is writing to. All of their joy would be depleted and dripped dry by everything that's going on in their life. And so then for us as well, living in the year 2020, this year where it seems that every day the media is either joking about or lamenting the fact that nothing seems to, that nothing could possibly get worse tomorrow. Well, what's going to happen tomorrow has been the, the theme of 2020 because it seems that everything is turned upside down. That's a, that's a threat to our thankfulness if we're only focused on our circumstances. If, if, we, if we think that our gratitude is based merely on our circumstances, then thank, thanks living is impossible. But when we realize that our gratitude isn't based on these things, 
then we'll see that it is possible. And this takes us to our second point, the call. The call for thanks living. Paul speaks into all that hardship and he calls for three things. Rejoice, pray, and give thanks. And so let's look at each of these in turn. These are three interconnected ingredients that make up the thankful life. And children, you can try to bake apple pie without apples, but it's not going to work because apples are essential ingredients. And so you can try to live the thankful life without these things, and it won't work because these are essential ingredients. Let's take a look at them. First, verse 16, rejoice always. Rejoice. Be joyful. Paul's not talking here about emotional highs. He's not talking here about light feelings. He's talking about this supernatural fruit of the Spirit. Back in chapter 1, verse 6, the very first verse that we read, he said, having received the word in much affliction, how with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And so even in this letter, Paul has connected joy with the Spirit, saying this is something supernatural. This joy is something that's worked by God. It's a gift of God. It's something that's impossible apart from the Spirit's work. It's it's worked by God, and it's directed in God. Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. That's how we can complete our text here. Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul is saying the same thing. The Lord, he is the object of our rejoicing. And so this joy, it's a heart attitude. It's an attitude of taking pleasure in the certain reality that everything is coming from my good Father's hand and everything is serving my Father's good purpose. That's what this joy is. It's not light feelings. It's not uh, some sort of emotion. It's this certain joy, this, this satisfaction that everything is coming to me in life from my Father's good hand and everything is serving his good purposes. And so while this is a fruit of the Spirit, this joy must be fought for. Uh, we must wrestle for this joy. We must clutch and and grab to to try to have this joy, to get a hold of it more in our lives, or maybe better, to get a hold of ourselves so we might have this joy. And when should we do this? Just on Thanksgiving? Of course not. Paul says, rejoice always. Always be wrestling to be satisfied with your Father and with his providences. If we don't fight for this joy, then what are we left with? Just think about that. If you don't fight for this joy in God, what are you left with? Grumbling about God. You're you're left with being fed up with our Father and with his ways. And so by the Spirit's power, by his prompting, by the Spirit's word, wrestle for this joy. Faith fights hard to have more of this joy. Now, to be clear, Paul is not saying you can't be sad. Paul is not saying you can't sorrow. Remember chapter, three, verse four, chapter 4, verse 13. Paul was counseling the grieving. He's speaking to those who have lost loved ones in this church. And he didn't say you can't grieve. He didn't say you can't be sad. He didn't say you can't sorrow. But he said don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Don't don't sorrow as those who have no Father in heaven directing everything. Don't sorrow as those who, who have no Christ who is risen from the grave. Don't sorrow in that way, but sorrow by rejoicing in your Father, by rejoicing in his hand directing all things. Through your tears, be rejoicing always in God, being satisfied wrestling to be satisfied in his ways and his purposes. And Paul knows that in the most agonizing moments, the Holy Spirit is able to fill the soul with this this kind of satisfaction in the Lord. 
And so he says, rejoice always. But second, the second ingredient, first joy, second, pray. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Now, when we speak about prayer, we're not primarily talking about the lips, but we're talking about the heart. Uh, The substance of prayer is the lifting up of our hearts to God. That's what's happening in prayer, when we're lifting up our hearts to God. And so Paul here isn't talking about literally mouthing prayers every second of our lives, but he's saying, be constant in lifting up your heart to God. Have this upward motion in your life. Be lifting up your requests. Be lifting up your confessions. Be lifting up your thanksgiving and your praises. Have this spirit of prayer. Pray without ceasing. And so the key here. If we were to boil this all down, the key here is dependence. Live dependent and conscious of the Lord's presence. Praying without ceasing means being absolutely dependent on God. It means taking Jesus seriously when he says, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. And then prayer then, it's, it's seeing our weakness. It's seeing that reality. It's seeing what we are up against, the things that we are called to, the things that we deal with on a daily basis. And it's then lifting our hearts up to God in dependence and saying, Lord, help me. Lord, I, I need you. Lord, where are you? Lord, thank you. If, if that's the inner language of your heart, then praise God. His spirit is at work. That dependence is not natural to the human heart. That dependence is the work of the spirit, that praying without ceasing. Yes, not that every day we live in that that place. We should. We're called to that. But we don't. But the fact that there is this this inner dialogue, this, this crying out to the Father, Father, help. Father, thank you for directing these things. That is getting at what Paul is is commanding for us here. Life is dreadfully hard, but I'm living it out of conscious dependence on God. Pray without ceasing. Well, how can we do this practically? Well, the spontaneous prayers, that praying without ceasing, that flows out of the routine prayers. I think that needs to be said. Sometimes we despise our routines. Now, if something is just rote routine and we're doing it to tick a box, then that's not good, of course. But routine, God has built routine into our life. He has given us a day in seven to gather for worship because God knows that routine is important for the Christian. And so don't despise your morning prayers or your mealtime prayers or your evening prayers because your spontaneous prayer life flows out of this 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 uh, routine time of prayer that when you set apart time to pray you are priming your pump to live in a way in which you are dependent on the lord and so yes overflowing out of that pray without ceasing if the thought comes into your mind i should pray then do it pray if you are with others and the thought comes into your mind we should pray then do it. Be polite and say, we should pray. Let's take a moment. Let's pray together. Pray without ceasing. Pray in the car. Pray in the kitchen. Pray on the soccer field. Pray. Pray silently. Pray out loud. Pray, pray, pray. That's what Paul is saying. Pray without ceasing. This is an essential ingredient to living a thankful life. This dependence and this consciousness of the Lord As our cares pile up, prayer helps us unload them back on God. Cast your cares upon me, for I care for you. And so don't abandon prayer. Don't give up. Don't grow hopeless. Pray. But third, in everything, in everything, give thanks. And it's interesting to note that Paul adds this, because giving thanks is really a subset of prayer. Isn't thanksgiving a part of, of, of praying, and yet Paul, he, he draws this out specifically, and he, he isolates this giving thanks, and, and why is that? 
Calvin says it's because our prayers often bear little, our, 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 sorry, excuse me, our prayers often are little better than complaints against God. And Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. And so he, Calvin says that Paul isolates thanksgiving to remind us to include these, these giving of thanks to the Lord in our prayers. And so he says, give thanks in everything. Now again, this giving of thanks is not just an emotion that happens. It's not a feeling that happens when we have full plates on the table. Of course, we are thankful. We should be thankful in that moment. But this giving of thanks is a decision It's an internal heart response in every situation, the Apostle Paul says. And so no situation is excluded. And maybe you you are saying, Paul, are you serious? In everything, in the persecutions we're going through, in the temptations we're facing, in the division that's threatening our church, give thanks, give thanks in everything? Yes, in everything. At every moment, under every circumstance, give thanks. How is that possible? That takes us to our final point, the reason. The reason for thanks living. Notice Paul has just given us three instructions. Rejoice, pray, and give thanks. He says, make that your lifestyle. Do that all the time. And now he's giving us the reason why in verse 18. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so notice first what Paul says. This is God's will for you. Young people, have you ever asked that question? What is God's will for me? What does God want me to do with my life? And this is an answer to that question And and it's not a full answer. It's not a complete answer. It doesn't give you everything, but it is a foundational answer. In everything, God wants us to be rejoicing in him, to be praying to him, and to be giving thanks for all that he has done for us. And so this is God's will, and that in itself is a compelling reason. We should be able to say, God wants me to do this. That's enough. I know he's good. And so his commands are good. But Paul gives us more than that, and this is where I want to focus the rest of our attention. Notice these key words. He says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In Christ Jesus. That's the supreme reason for gratitude. Paul is bringing to mind Jesus Christ. And he's bringing to mind the the constant and the unbreakable spiritual union and connection that the child of God has with his Savior. In Christ Jesus. This is speaking about about this intimate union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ is the reason for rejoicing, for praying, and for giving thanks. This gratitude, this thankful living, It's something that flows from being identified with Christ and therefore receiving all of his benefits. In Christ, the Father opens up to us the treasures of heaven. It's as if the Father is saying to us, here is my treasure chest, here is the best that I can give you, and he gives us Christ. In him are all spiritual blessings, Paul says in Ephesians 1. And so it's in Christ that the Father offers us all joy for our our misery that comes from our sin. It's in Christ that we have all abundance that meets our lack. We are weak in ourself. But in Christ, in Christ we have a wealth of resources. And so do you see what Paul is doing? He's saying to us, see everything through the lens of Jesus. So so picture this. It's as if he's saying, you have this this pair of, of glasses and these are your Jesus glasses and every day put your Jesus glasses on so you see the world. You see your circumstances. You see your suffering, your loss, your grief. You see it in connection to Jesus Christ. That's our only hope for living a thankful life. Because our circumstances do deplete us. 
we do go through hardship. And, and, and the division maybe around us or the people around us who are difficult, they drain us. And, and the worries and the stresses at work or at home, they get to us. And, and we're not superhuman. And so we can't float above the clouds all the time. But when we put on the lens of Jesus Christ, when we bear in mind consciously who Christ is, what he has done for us, and our inseparable connection to him, then at every moment, we can give thanks. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Yes, when we're empty of ourself, then we can be full of Christ. That's often how God works. That's often how God intentionally works. He intentionally directs hardship into our life so that we would stop sinning, stop being filled with ourself, and so that he would give us the far better gift than comfort, namely Jesus Christ, that we would be full of him. And so, child of God, at every moment of your life, you are connected to Christ. That's what Paul wants you to know this Thanksgiving. Every moment of your life, today, as you celebrate, tomorrow, maybe as you go back to work, still connected to Christ. The Spirit has worked that connection. That can't go away. But what does that mean in a practical way for me? I think Acts 9 helps us here. Acts chapter 9, there's Paul before his conversion. And he is Saul of Tarsus, and he's on his way to Damascus, breathing out threatenings and murder against the church. And you remember how Jesus Christ suddenly stops him there in Acts 9 verse 4. There's this blinding light, and Paul falls to the ground, and then there's this thundering voice from heaven. It's Christ speaking. And do you remember what Jesus says? Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting my people, my church, believers? No. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus here is saying, I am one with my people. I am so intimately attached to them that Paul, if you attack them, you attack me. And so this is union with Christ. What happens to me happens to Jesus. And this is important for us to grab hold of in our daily life because so often we feel as if God is against us. We feel as if God is making mistakes in our life. Our life is, is, is a mess. We are suffering. We are stressing out. It seems like it's out of control and it's useless. But whenever those thoughts come into your mind, and they will, Whenever they come into your mind, grab hold of yourself and say, the Father would never make Christ suffer pointlessly. The Father loves the Son. He would never make Christ suffer pointlessly. And therefore, because I am connected to Christ, he will never make me suffer pointlessly either. What a profound comfort that gives when we are going through difficulty. Difficulty. There is a purpose. It tells us there is a purpose behind every second of anguish. Maybe this Thanksgiving you woke up and you said, I can't give thanks today. Too much wrong has gone in my life. Too much hardship has gone on this past year. Well, recognize that if you are in Christ, that all of that hardship has come to you and you are connected to Christ, and the Father would never pointlessly make Christ suffer. And so therefore, he would never pointlessly make you suffer. All of your pain has a purpose behind it. Our good Father, he has a purpose. We don't see the weight of glory that the Father is working for us now. But in eternity, when our eyes are open to the mysteries of God's providences, then we will see, it'll become clear that these pains over here, this suffering over here, this affliction over here, all of that was just to increase our eternal joy in him. And I guarantee you that then we will be giving thanks. We will be praising God for even the most worst suffering that we are enduring in this life. Christ is, 
not our circumstances. Christ is the reason for the thankful life. So do you have Christ? Do you have Christ? You need him. Apart from him, thanksgiving and thanks living is impossible. But when you have Christ with him, with his spirit, this can become more and more your reality. Regardless of your circumstances, more and more, the spirit can take us to places where we are rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, and giving thanks in every circumstance. And so then once you have Christ, then your, then your circumstances begin to work as fuel for thanksgiving. No, our circumstances, our prosperity aren't the basis for our thankfulness, but they add fuel to the fire. It, it's when we have Christ that we, that we see all of a sudden that all of the gifts, all of the prosperity, all of the things in our life, they have come because of Christ. They have come from the Father through Christ to us. And so that works up more thankfulness in our hearts then. So then we see our family, the good gift of family, and we thank God. We see our church, and we thank God. We see our work, and we thank God. We see our school, the food that's on our table. We, we turn on the tap. We have running water. Praise be to God. We enjoy his sunshine, and we give him thanks. And so we can enjoy the gifts that God gives us. Paul does that, 1 Timothy 4.4. 4. He says, every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. And so it's when we have Christ, when Christ is the basis of, of our thankfulness, then through him, we can receive all these other things. Let me close with a quote by Andrew Bonar, a Scottish theologian from 150 years ago. He said, thanksgiving is the heir of heaven. Thanksgiving is the heir of heaven. That's the air we're going to be breathing for all eternity. And in this life, God has said, take a deep breath and fill your lungs with that sweet heavenly breeze because of Jesus Christ. Amen.